The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay. Well, last time I was lecturing, uh, we were, talk we were uh, talking about regression analysis. And we finished up talking about estimation methods for <coughs> fitting regression models. Um, I want to recap the method of maximum likelihood because this is really the primary estimation method in statistical modeling that you start with. And uh, so let me just review uh, where we were. We have a normal linear regression model. A dependent variable y is explained by a linear combination of independent variables uh, given by a regression parameter beta, and we assume that there are errors about all the cases which are independent and identically distributed normal random variables. So uh, because of that relationship, the dependent variable vector y, which is an n vector for n cases, is a multivariate normal random variable. Now um, the likelihood function is equal to the density function for the data. And there's you know, some ambiguity, really, about how one manipulates the likelihood function. Um, the likelihood function becomes defined once we've observed a sample of data. So in this uh, expression for the likelihood function as a function of beta and sigma squared, we're considering evaluating the probability density function for the data conditional on the unknown parameters. So if this were simply a univariate normal distribution with some unknown mean and variance, then what we would have is just a sort of bell curve uh, for mu centered around a single observation y, if you look at the likelihood function and how, how it varies with, with uh, the underlying mean and of the uh, normal distribution. Um, so this likelihood function uh, is, uh, the challenge, really, in maximum likelihood estimation is really uh, uh, calculating and computing the likelihood function. Um, and with normal linear regression models, it's very easy. Now, uh, the, the maximum likelihood estimates are those values that maximize this function. And the question is, why are those good estimates of the underlying parameters? Um, well. What those estimates do is they are the parameter values for which the observed data is most likely. So we're able to scale the unknown parameters by how likely those parameters could have generated these data values. So let's look at <coughs> the likelihood function for this normal linear regression model. Okay, these first two lines here are highlighting, the first line is highlighting that our response variable values are independent. They're conditionally independent given the unknown parameters. And so the density of the full vector of y's is simply the product of the density functions for those uh, components. And because this is a normal linear regression model, each of the yi's is normally distributed. So what's in there is simply the density function of a normal random variable with mean given by the beta sum of independent variables for each i, uh, case i uh, given by the regression parameters. And that expression you know, basically can be expressed in matrix form this way. And <clears throat> what we have is the likelihood function is, ends up being a function of our Q of beta, which was our least squares criterion. So least squares estimation is equivalent to maximum likelihood estimation for the regression parameters if we have a normal linear regression model. Um, and there's this extra term, minus n, well, actually, if we're going to maximize the likelihood function, we can also maximize the log of the likelihood function because that's just a monotone function 
of the likelihood. And it's easier to maximize the log of the likelihood function, which is expressed here. And so uh, we're able to maximize over beta by minimizing q of beta. And then we can maximize over sigma squared, given our estimate for beta. And that's achieved by taking the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to sigma squared. So we basically have this forced order condition that finds the maximum because things are appropriately uh, convex. And taking that derivative we, uh, and solving for 0, we basically get this expression. So this is just taking the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to sigma squared. And you'll notice here I'm taking the derivative with respect to sigma squared as a parameter, not sigma. <coughs> And that gives us that the maximum likelihood estimate of the error variance is q of beta hat over n. So this is the sum of the squared residuals divided by n. Now I you know, emphasize here that that's biased. Who can tell me why that's biased or why it ought to be biased? Okay, well, it should be n minus 1 if we're actually estimating one parameter. So, you know, if we were estimating, uh, and if the independent variables were, say, a, a constant, 1, so we're just estimating a, a, a sample from a normal with mean beta 1 corresponding to the units vector of the x, then uh, we would have a one degree correction for one, uh, or sorry, one degree of freedom correction to the residuals to get an unbiased estimator. But what if we have p parameters? Well, let me ask you this. What if we had n parameters in our regression model? What would happen if we had a, uh, you know, a full rank n independent variable matrix and n independent observations? Yes, you'd have an exact fit to the data. So there would be, this estimate would be zero. Okay. And so uh, clearly, if the data do arise from a normal linear regression model, zero <laughs> is not unbiased, right? And you need to have some correction. It turns out you need to uh, divide by n minus the rank of the X matrix, the degrees of freedom in the model, uh, to get a biased estimate. So. So this is uh, an important issue. Well, it highlights how the more parameters you add in the model, the more precise your fitted values are. In a sense, there's dangers of curve fitting, which you, know, you want to avoid. Uh, but the uh, maximum likelihood uh, estimates, in fact, are biased. And you just have to be aware of that. And when you're using different software fitting different models, you need to know whether there are various corrections being made for unbiasedness or not. Um, but, um, okay, so, so this uh, solves the estimation problem for normal linear regression models. And when we have normal linear regression models, the theorem we went through last time is very important. Let me just go back and highlight that for you. Um, okay, this theorem right here. Okay, this is, this is the, really the important, uh, a very important theorem indicating what is the distribution of the least squares now, the maximum likelihood estimates of our regression model. Okay, they are normally distributed. And uh, the residuals, sums of squares, have a chi-squared distribution with degrees of freedom given by n minus p. And we can look at how uh, how much sort of signal to noise there is in estimating our regression parameters by calculating a t-statistic, which is take away from an estimate its expected value, its mean, and divide through by an estimate of the variability in standard deviation units. And that will have a t-distribution. So that, that's a critical uh, uh, way to assess uh, 
the relevance of different explanatory variables in our <coughs> model. And, and this uh, approach will apply in max with maximum likelihood estimation in all kinds of models apart from normal linear regression models. It turns out maximum likelihood estimates generally are asymptotically normally distributed. And so these properties here will apply uh, for those models as well. So let's uh, finish up these notes on estimation by talking about generalized M estimation. Um, so what we want to consider is estimating unknown parameters by minimizing some function, Q of beta, which is a sum of evaluations of another function, H, evaluated for each of the individual cases. And choosing H to take on different uh, functional forms will define different kinds of estimators. Um, uh, we've seen how when H is simply uh, the square of the case minus its regression prediction, um, that leads to least squares and, in fact, maximum likelihood estimation, um, as we saw before. Rather than taking the square of the sort of residual, the fitted residual, we could take simply the, the modulus of that. And uh, so that would be the mean absolute deviation. So rather than summing the square deviations from the mean, we could sum the absolute deviations from the mean. Now, from a mathematical standpoint, if we want to solve for those estimates, how would you go about doing that? I know, what methodology would you use to maximize this function? Well, we'd try and apply basically the same principles of if this is a convex function, then uh, we just want to take derivatives of that and solve for that being equal to zero. So what happens when you take the derivative of the modulus of y i minus x i beta with respect to beta? Uh, what did you say? What did you say? Yeah, I, I, I just, it's, it's not continuous. Yeah. It's not, the first second order derivative is not continuous. <coughs> okay. Well, this is a, not a smooth function, but it's, if we, let me just plot xi beta here. Um, and uh, y i minus that. Um, basically, this is going to be a function that has slope 1 when it's positive and slope minus 1 when it's negative. And so that will be true. Um, component-wise, or, or for the y. So what we end up wanting to do is find the value of the regression estimate that minimizes uh, the sum of predictions that are below the estimate plus the sum of the predictions that are above the estimate given by the regression line. And, and that solves the problem. Now, um, with uh, maximum likelihood estimation, one can plug in minus log the density of yi given beta x and sigma i squared. And that function is simply sums to the log of the joint density for all the data. So that works as well. Um, with robust m estimators, we can consider another function chi, which can be defined to have good properties with estimates. And there's a whole theory of robust estimation that's very rich which talks about how best to uh, specify this chi function. Now, um, one of the problems with least squares estimation is that the squares of very large values are very, very large in magnitude. So there's perhaps an undue influence of very large values, uh, very large residuals in under least squares estimation and maximum likelihood estimation. So robust M estimators allow you to control that uh, by uh, defining the function differently. 
Um, finally, uh, there are quantile estimators which extend uh, the sort of mean absolute deviation criterion. And so if we consider the H function to be basically a multiple of the deviation if the residual is positive and a different multiple, sort of a complementary multiple if the deviation, the residual is less than zero, then by varying tau you end up getting quantile estimators where what you're doing is minimizing an estimate of the tau quantile. So the uh, so, so this general class of M estimators is, uh, encompasses most, most estimators that we will uh, encounter in, in fitting models. All right, so that finishes the technical or the mathematical discussion of regression analysis. Let me uh, highlight for you um, let's see let's see there's there's a case study that was dragged to the desktop here and I wanted to find that okay let me find that all right okay um, there's a case study that's been uh, added to the course website, and this first one is on uh, linear regression models for asset pricing. And I want you to uh, read through that just to see how uh, it applies to fitting various simple linear regression models. And let's see here, is it full screen? Okay, with this. Okay, this, this case study begins by introducing the capital asset pricing model, which basically suggests uh, that if you look at the returns on any stocks in an efficient market, then those should uh, depend on the return of the overall market, but scaled by how risky the stock is. And so if one looks at how risk, you know, basically what the return is on the stock on the right scale, uh, you should have a simple linear regression model. So here we just look at uh, time series for a GE stock in the S&P 500. And the case study goes through how you can actually collect this data on the web using R. And so uh, you know, the, the uh, case notes you know, provide those details. Um, there's also uh, the three-month treasury rate, which is uh, collected. And so if you're thinking about return on the stock versus return on the index, well, what's really of interest is the excess return over a risk-free rate. And in the efficient markets models, uh, basically the excess return of a stock is related to the excess, is related to the uh, excess return of the market as given by a linear regression model. So we can fit this model, and uh, here's a plot of the excess returns on a daily basis for GE stock versus the market. So that looks like a nice sort of point cloud for which a linear model might fit well, and it does. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, there are, uh, well, there are regression diagnostics, which I'll get to in it. Well, there are regression diagnostics which are detailed in the problem set where we're looking at you know, how influential are individual observations, what's their impact on regression parameters. Um, this uh, display here basically highlights with a very simple linear regression model what are the influential data points. And so I've highlighted in red those values which are influential. Now, if you look at the definition of leverage in a linear model, it's very simple. Uh, simple linear model is just those observations that are very far from the mean have large leverage. And so you can confirm that uh, with your answers to, to the problem set. Um, okay, this X indicates a significant or influential point in terms of the regression parameters. Uh, 
uh, given by Cook's distance, and that uh, definition is, is also given in the case notes. Which one of those are um, By computing the individual leverages with a function that's given here, and by uh, selecting out those that exceed a given magnitude. Okay. Now, with uh, this very, very simple model of stocks depending on one unknown factor, uh, risk factor given the market, in, in modeling equity returns, the, uh, there are many different factors that can, can have an impact on, on returns. So um, what I've done in the case study is to look at adding another factor, which is um, just the oil, uh, let's see, the return on crude oil. And so, let's see, I need to go down here. So let me, let me highlight something for you here. Okay, with, with GE stock, what would you expect the impact of, a uh, say, a high return on crude oil to be on, on the return of GE stock? Would you expect it to be positively related or negatively related? Okay. Um, well, GE is a stock that's you know, just a broad stock that you know, invests in many different industries and really reflects sort of the overall market to some extent. But many years ago, probably 10, 15 years ago, it was GE represented maybe sort of 3% of the GMP of the U.S. market. So it was really highly related to how well the market does. Now, crude oil is a commodity. And oil is used to drive cars, to, you know, fuel uh, energy production. So if you have an increase in oil prices, then the cost of essentially doing business goes up. So, uh, it's, so it is associated with like an inflation factor. Prices are rising. So um, if you can <coughs> see here, the uh, regression estimate, if we add in the factor of the uh, return on crude oil, it's negative 0.03 and it has a T value of minus 3.561. So, in fact, there, you know, the market, in a sense, over this period for this analysis, you know, was not efficient in explaining the return on GE. Um, crude oil is another independent factor that helps explain returns. So, you know, that's useful to know. And if you are clever about defining and identifying uh, and evaluating different factors, you can build uh, factor uh, asset pricing models that are very, very useful uh, for investing and trading. Now, as, as a comparison to this, this case study uh, also uh, applied the same analysis to ExxonMobil. Now, ExxonMobil is an oil company. So um, let me highlight this here. We basically are fitting this model now that's highlighted. And here, if we consider this two-factor model, the regression parameter corresponding to the crude oil factor is plus 0.13 with a T value of 16. So crude oil definitely has an impact on the value or uh, the return of ExxonMobil. It basically goes up and down with oil prices. Um, now, let's see. Let's see, this, this case study closes with a uh, scatter plot of the independent variables and highlighting where the influential values are. And so just in the same way that with a simple linear regression, it was those that were far away from the mean of the data were influential. In a multivariate setting here, it's bivariate. The influential observations are those that are very far away from the centroid. And if you look at uh, one of the problems in the problem set, it actually goes through and you can see uh, where this, these leverage values are and how it indicates sort of influences associated with the Mahalanobis distance uh, 
of cases from the centroid of the independent variables. So if you're a sort of a visual type mathematician as opposed to an algebraic type mathematician, you know, I think these kinds of graphs are very helpful in understanding what is really going on. And uh, the uh, degree of influence is associated with the fact that we're basically taking least squares estimates. And uh, so we have the quadratic form associated with the overall process. All right. <coughs> there's, <coughs> there's another case study that uh, I'll be happy to discuss uh, after class or during office hours. I don't think we have time today during the lecture, but it concerns exchange rate regimes. And the second case study uh, looks at um, the Chinese yuan, which was basically pegged to the dollar. Uh, for many years. And then, uh, I guess through po political influence from other countries, they uh, started to let the uh, yuan vary from the dollar, but have perhaps pegged it to some basket of security, of, of currencies. And so how would you determine what that basket of currencies is? Well, there are regression methods that have been developed by economists that help you do that. And that case study goes through the analysis of that. So check that out to see how you can get immediate access to currency data and be fitting these regression models and looking at the different results and trying to evaluate those. OK. So let's turn now. to The main topic. Let's see here. Which is time series analysis. Okay, today, I, in the rest of the lecture, I want to talk about univariate time series analysis. Um, and so we're thinking of uh, basically a random variable that's observed over time, and it's a dis discrete time process. And we'll uh, introduce you to. The Wold representation theorem and definitions of stationarity and its relationship there. Then look at the classic models of uh, autoregressive moving average models um, and then extending those to non stationarity with integrated uh, autoregressive moving average models. And then finally, talk about estimating stationary models and how we test for stationarity. So let's begin with, you know, from basically first principles, uh, we have a stochastic process, uh, a discrete time stochastic process, X, which is, is, consists of random variables indexed by time, and we're thinking now discrete time. The stochastic behavior of this sequence is determined by specifying the density or probability mass functions for all finite collections of time indexes. And uh, so if we could specify all finite dimensional distributions of this process, we would specify this probability model for the stochastic process. Um, now, this stochastic process is strictly stationary if the density function for any collection of times T1 through Tm is equal to the density function with, for a, a tau translation of that. So the density function for any finite dimensional distribution is stationary, is constant under arbitrary translations. So uh, you know, that's uh, a very strong property, but um, it's a reasonable property to ask for if you're doing statistical modeling. And what do you want to do when you're estimating models? You want to estimate things that are constant. Uh, constants are nice things to estimate. And uh, parameters of models are constant. So we really want uh, the underlying structure of the uh, distributions to be uh, the same. All right. The, uh, OK. That was strict stationarity, which requires knowledge of the entire distribution of the stochastic process. 
Um, we're now going to introduce a weaker definition, which is covariant stationarity. And a covariant stationary process has a constant mean, mu, a constant variance, sigma squared, and a covariance at um, over increments tau, given by a function gamma of tau, that is also constant. And it's not gamma is isn't a constant function, but the basically for all t, uh, covariance of x t x t plus tau is this gamma of tau function. Um, and uh, we also have can introduce the autocorrelation function of the stochastic process, rho of tau. And so um, <coughs> the correlation of two random variables is the covariance of those random variables divided by the square root of the product of the variances. Um, and Chungbom, I think, introduced that a bit uh, in one of his lectures where we were talking about uh, the correlation function. Um, but um, essentially, the correlation function is if you standardize the data or the random variables to have mean zero, so subtract off the means and then divide through by their standard deviations. So those translated variables have mean zero and variance one, then the correlation coefficient is the covariance between those standardized random variables. Um, so this is going to come up again and again in uh, time series analysis. Now the Wald representation theorem is a very, very powerful theorem about covariant stationary processes. Um, it basically states that if we have a zero mean covariant stationary time series, then it can be decomposed into two components that have very nice structure. Okay. Uh, basically, it, xt can be decomposed into vt plus st. vt is going to be a linearly deterministic pr process, meaning that past values of vt perfectly predict what vt is going to be. So this could be like a linear trend or some fixed function of past values. It's basically a deterministic process. So there's nothing random in VT. It's, it's something that's, that's, uh, that's fixed uh, without randomness. And ST is a sum of coefficients psi i times eta t minus i, where the eta t minus i, or the eta t's, are linearly unpredictable white noise. So what we have is ST is a weighted average of white noise with coefficients given by the psi i. And the coefficients psi i are such that psi 0 is 1, and the sum of the squared psi i's is finite. And the white noise a to t, okay, what's white noise? It has expectation 0. It has variance given by sigma squared that's constant, and it has covariance across different white noise elements that's zero for all t and s. So a to t are uh, uncorrelated with themselves, and of course they are uncorrelated with the deterministic process. So you know, this is really a very, very powerful uh, concept. You know, if, if you are modeling a process and it has covariant stationarity, then there exists a representation like this of the function. So it's uh, a, a very compelling uh, structure, um, which uh, we'll see how, how it applies in different circumstances. Now, uh, before getting into the definition of autoregressive moving average models, um, I just want to uh, give you an intuitive understanding of what's going on with the wall decomposition. Um, and this, I think, will help motivate why the wall decomposition should exist from a mathematical standpoint. Um, so consider just some univariate 
stochastic process, some time series xt that we want to model. And we believe that it's covariant stationary. And so we want to specify essentially the wall decomposition of that. Well, what we could do is initialize a parameter p, the number of past observations, in the linearly deterministic term. And then estimate the linear projection of xt on the last p lag values. And so what I want to do is consider estimating uh, that relationship using a sample of size n with some ending point t naught less than or equal to t. And so we can consider um, y values, like a response variable, being given by the successive values of our uh, time series. And so our response variables yj can be considered to be xt0 minus n plus j, um, and define a y vector and a z matrix as follows. So we have values of our stochastic process in Y, and then our Z matrix, which is essentially a matrix of independent variables, is just the lagged values of this, of this process. So let's apply ordinary least squares to specify the projection. Okay, this projection matrix is, should be familiar now. And that basically gives us a, pre a prediction of Y hat depending on P lags. And we can compute the projection residual from that fit. Well, we can conduct time series methods to analyze these residuals, which we'll be introducing here uh, in a few minutes, um, to specify a moving average model. We can then have estimates of the underlying coefficients psi and estimates of the, these residuals, a to t, and then we can evaluate whether this is a good model or not. Okay, what th does it mean to be an appropriate model? Well, the residuals should be orthogonal to longer lags than t minus s, or longer lags than p. So we basically shouldn't have any dependence of our residuals on lags of the uh, stochastic process that weren't included in the model. Those should be orthogonal. Um, and the A to T hats should be consistent with white noise. So uh, those, those issues can be evaluated. And if there's evidence otherwise, then we can change the specification of the model. We can add additional lags. We can add additional deterministic variables if we you know, deter can identify uh, what those might be and proceed with this process. But essentially, that is uh, how the wall dec decomposition would be, could be implemented. And theoretically, as our sample gets large, if we're observing this time series um, for a long time, then the limit, uh, well, certainly the limit of the projections as p, the number of lags we include, gets large, should be essentially the projection of our data on its history. And that, in fact, is the uh, projection corresponding to defining the coefficient psi. I. And so in the limit, those will, uh, that projection will converge. And it will converge in the sense that the coefficients on the, of the projection definition correspond to the psi. I. And uh, now. Um, if uh, p goes to infinity is required, now p means that there's basically a long-term dependence in the process. I mean, it does depend on, it, it, basically it doesn't stop at a given lag, it just, uh, the dependence, uh, uh, it persists over time. Then we may require that p goes to infinity. Now what happens when p goes to infinity? Well, and if you let p go to infinity too quickly, you run out of degrees of freedom to estimate your models. 
And so uh, from an implementation standpoint, you need to let p over n go to zero so that you have essentially more data per observate than object or more data than parameters that you're estimating. And uh, so that, that becomes required. And um, in time series modeling, what we look for are models where <coughs> finite numbers of val finite values of p are required. Uh, so we're only estimating a finite number of parameters. Or if we have a moving average model which has coefficients that are infinite in number, perhaps those can be defined by a small number of parameters. So uh, we'll be looking for, for that kind of feature in different models. All right. Let's turn to talking about the lag operator. Uh, the lag operator is you know, a fundamental tool in time series models. Um, we uh, consider the operator L that shifts the time series back by one time increment. And applying this operator recursively, we get if it's operating zero times, there's no lag. One time, there's one lag. Two times, two lags, doing that iteratively. And in thinking of these, you know, th what we're dealing with is like a, a transformation on infinite dimensional space where it's like the identity matrix sort of shifted by one element. Or not the identity, but you know, an element. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's like the identity matrix shifted by one column or s two columns. Um, so uh, anyway, inverses of these operators are well defined in terms of what we get from them. So uh, if we, we can represent the world representation in terms of uh, these lag operators by saying that our stochastic process xt is equal to vt plus this psi of l function, basically a uh, functional of the lag operator, which is a potentially infinite order polynomial of the lags. So, so this notation is something that you need to get very familiar with if you're going to be comfortable with the different models that are introduced with ARMA uh, and ARIMA models. Um, any questions about that? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, now, relating to this, let me just introduce now because this will come up uh, somewhat later. But there's the impulse response function of the covariant stationary process. Okay, if we have a stochastic process xt, which is given by this world representation, then you can ask yourself, what happens when there's what, what happens to the innovation at time t, which is a to t? How does that affect the process over time? And so, okay, if you know, pretend that you are, you know, chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, and uh, you're interested in uh, GNP, <laughs> or you know, basically economic growth, and uh, you're considering changing interest rates to help the economy. Well, you'd like to know what an impact is of your change in this factor, is how that's going to affect the. Uh, variable of interest, perhaps G and P. Now, in this case, we're thinking of just a simple covariant stationary stochastic process. There's no, uh, it, it's, it's basically a process that is a random, a weighted sum, a moving average of innovations A to T. But the question is, basically, any covariant stationary process can be represented in this form. And the impulse response uh, function relates to what is the impact of A to T? What's its impact over time? Basically, it, it affects the process at time t. That, because of the moving average process, affects it at t plus 1, affects it at t plus 2. And so this impulse <coughs> response is uh, basically the derivative of the value of the process with the j previous innovation. It's given by psi j. So, the different innovations have an impact on the current value given by this impulse response function. 
So looking backward, that definition is pretty well defined. But you can also think about how does an impact of the innovation affect the process going forward. And the long-run cumulative response is essentially what is the impact of that innovation in the process ultimately. And eventually it's, 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 it's not going to change the value of the process, but you know, what is the value to which the, the process is moving because of that one innovation? And so the long-run cumulative response is given by basically the sum of these individual ones, and it's given by the sum of the psi i's. Um, so that's the polynomial of psi with lag operator where we replace the lag operator by one. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see this again when we uh, talk about uh, vector autoregressive processes um, with multivariate time series. All right, so now the walled representation, which is a infinite order moving average, possibly infinite order, uh, can have an autoregressive representation. Um, suppose that there is uh, another polynomial psi i star of the lags, which, is, which we're going to call psi inverse of L, which satisfies the fact that if you multiply that with psi of L, you get the identity like zero, then this psi inverse, if that exists, um, is basically the inversion of this uh, uh, psi of L, or the, it, it, yeah, is the inverse of the psi of L. So if we start with psi of L, if that's invertible, then there exists a psi inverse of L with coefficients psi I star, and one can basically take our original expression for the stochastic process, which is as this moving average of the eta's, and express it as this uh, essentially moving averages of the x's. And so we've essentially inverted the process um, and sh show that the stochastic process has, can be expressed as an infinite order autoregressive <coughs> representation. And so this infinite order autoregressive representation corresponds to that intuitive understanding of how the walled representation exists. And it actually uh, works with the, uh, or the regression coefficients in that projection several slides back corresponds to this inverse operator. All right, so let's turn to some uh, specific time series models that are, that are widely used. Um, the class of autoregressive moving average processes has this mathematical uh, definition. We define the xt to be equal to a linear combination of lags of x going back p lags with, um, with coefficients phi 1 through phi p. And then there are residuals which um, are expressed in terms of uh, a qth order moving average. So um, in this framework, the eta t's are white noise. And white noise, to reiterate, is mean 0, constant variance, 0 covariance between those. In this representation, I've simplified things a little bit by subtracting off the mean from all of the x's. And uh, that just makes the formulas a little bit more simpler. Now with lag operators, we can write this ARMA model as phi of L, a pth order polynomial of lag L given with coefficients 1 phi 1 up to phi p and theta of L uh, given by uh, 1 theta 1 theta 2 up to theta q. And the wall decomposition has this, uh, well, okay, 
the wall decomposition, okay, this is basically a representation of the ARMA time series model. All right, basically we're taking a set of lags of the independent, of, of the values of the t stochastic process up to order p, and that's equal to a weighted average of the eta t's. If we multiply by the inverse of phi of l, if that exists, then we get this representation here, which is simply the wall decomposition. So the ARMA models uh, basically have a wall decomposition um, if this phi of l is invertible. And uh, we'll explore these by looking at simpler cases of the ARMA models by just focusing on autoregressive models first and then moving average processes second so that you'll get a better feel for how, how these things are manipulated and interpreted. So, so let's move on to the pth order autoregressive process. So we're going to consider ARMA models that are just, which just have autoregressive terms in them. And <coughs> So, let's do, so we have phi of L, x t minus mu, is equal to eta t, which is white noise. So a linear combination of the series is white noise. Um, and x t follows, then, a linear regression model on explanatory variables, which are lags of the uh, process x. And this can be expressed as xt equal to c plus the sum from 1 to p of phi j xt minus j, which is a linear regression model with regression parameters phi j. And c, the constant term, is equal to mu times phi of 1. Now, if you uh, basically take expectations of the, uh, of the process, um, you basically have coefficients of mu coming in from all the terms, and uh, phi of 1 times mu is the uh, regression coefficient there. All right. So with this autoregressive model, we now want to go over what are the stationarity conditions. Um, certainly, uh, this autoregressive model is uh, one where, well, a simple random walk is, follows an autoregressive model but it's not stationary. We'll highlight that in a minute as well, but if you think about it, that's true. And so uh, stationarity is, is something to be uh, understood and evaluated. The, uh, <coughs> okay, this, this uh, polynomial function phi, where if we replace the lag operator L by Z, a complex variable, um, the uh, equation phi of z equal to zero is the characteristic equation associated with this autoregressive model. And um, it turns out that we'll be interested in the roots of this characteristic equation. Uh, now, if we consider writing phi of L as a function of the roots of the equation, we get this expression where <coughs> you'll notice if you multiply all those terms out, the ones all multiply out together and you get one. And with the lag operator L to the pth power, that would be the product of one over lambda one times one over lambda two, or actually negative one over lambda one times negative 1 over lambda 2, and so forth out there, negative 1 over lambda p. But um, you know, basically, if there are p roots to this equation, this is, a, this is how it would be written out. And uh, the covariance, the, 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 matri or the process x, t, is covariance stationary if and only if all the roots of this characteristic equation lie outside the unit circle. So um, what does that mean? That means that the norm modulus of the complex Z is uh, greater than 1. So they're outside the unit circle where it's less than or equal to 1. And the roots 
if they uh, <coughs> are outside the unit circle, um, then the modulus of the lambda j's is greater than 1. And if we then consider taking a complex number lambda, basically the root, and have an expression for 1 minus 1 over lambda L inverse, we can get this series expression for that inverse. And that series will exist and sort of be bounded if the lambda i are greater than 1 in magnitude. So we can actually compute an inverse of phi of L by taking the inverse of each of the component products in that polynomial. So, uh, you know, the, and in introductory time series courses, they talk about stationarity and unit roots, but they don't really get into it because people don't know complex math, don't know about roots. Uh, so, anyway, but this is just, you know, very simply how that uh, framework is applied. So, so we have a polynomial uh, equation for the characteristic equation whose roots we're looking for, and those roots have to be outside the unit circle for stationarity of the process. Well, okay, it's, it's basically the conditions for invertibility of the process, of the autoregressive process, and that invertibility renders the process an infinite order moving average process. So let's go through these results for the autoregressive process of order one, where things, you know, when we start with the simplest case to understand things. Okay, the uh, characteristic equation for this model is just one minus phi z. The root is one over phi. So lambda is greater than one. Uh, if the modulus of lambda is greater than one, meaning the root is outside the unit circle, then phi is less than one. So for covariant stationarity of this autoregressive process, we need the magnitude of phi to be less than 1 in magnitude. Um, okay, the expected value of x is mu. The variance of x is uh, sigma squared x. This has this form, sigma squared over 1 minus phi. That expression is, is basically obtained by looking at the infinite order moving average representation. Um, but notice that if phi is positive, then the variance of x is actually less, uh, is actually greater than the variance of the innovations. And if phi is uh, less than zero, then it's going to be smaller. So the innovation variance basically um, is, is sort of scaled up a bit in the, in the autoregressive process. The covariance matrix is phi times sigma squared x. You'll be going through this in the uh, problem set. And the uh, covariance of, of x is phi to the j power sigma squared x. Um, and these expressions can all be easily evaluated by simply writing out the definition of these covariances in terms of the original model and looking at what terms are independent, cancel out, and that proceeds. All right. So let's, let's just go through these cases. Let's show it all here. All right, so we have, um, if phi is between 0 and 1, then the process experiences exponential mean reversion to mu. So an autoregressive process with phi between 0 and 1 corresponds to a mean reverting process. Um, this process is actually one that has been used theoretically for interest rate models and a lot of theoretical work in finance. Uh, the Vasicek model is actually an, uh, an example of the Ornstein-Ulenbeck process, which is uh, basically a mean reverting Brownian motion. Um, uh, 
And uh, <clears throat> any variables that exhibit or could be thought of as exhibiting mean reversion um, can be, uh, th this model can be applied to those processes, such as uh, interest rate spreads or real exchange rates, variables where one can expect that things never get too large or too small, they come back to some mean. Now, the challenge is that usually may be true over short periods of time, but over very long periods of time, the point to which you're reverting to changes. So these models tend to not have broad application over long time ranges, and you need to adapt them. Anyway, with the AR process, we can also have negative values of phi, which results in exponential mean reversion uh, that's oscillating in time because the, the autoregressive coefficient uh, basically is a negative value. Um, and, okay, for phi equal to 1, well, the wall decomposition doesn't exist, and the process is the simple random walk. So, uh, basically, if phi is equal to 1, that means that basically just changes in value of the process are independent and identically distributed white noise, and that's the random walk process. And that process, as was covered in earlier lectures, you know, is uh, non-stationary. If phi is greater than 1, then you have an explosive process because uh, basically the, the values are uh, scaling up every, every, every time increment. So, um, so those are features of the AR1 model. Um, for a general uh, autoregressive process of order P, um, there's a method, well, we can look at the second order moments of that process, which have a very nice structure and then use those to solve for estimates of the ARMA parameters, or autoregressive parameters. And uh, those happen to be specified by what are called the Yule-Walker equations. Um, so Yule-Walker equations is a standard topic in time series analysis. What is it? What does it correspond to? Well, we take our original autoregressive process of order P, and we write out the formulas for the covariance at lag j between two observations. So what's the covariance between xt and xt minus j? And that expression is given by this equation. And so this equation for gamma of j is determined simply by evaluating the expectations, where we're taking the expectation of xt in the autoregressive process times the fixed xt minus j minus mu. So just evaluating each of those terms, you can validate that this is the equation. If we look at the equations corresponding to j equals 1, so lag 1 up through lag p, this is what those equations look like. Basically, the left-hand side is gamma 1 through gamma p, the covariance to lag 1 up to lag p, is equal to basically func linear functions given by the phi of the other covariances. Um, who can tell me uh, you know, what the structure is of this matrix? It's not a diagonal matrix. What kind of matrix is this? Sort of a math trivia question here. But it has a special name. Anyone? It's a Toeplitz matrix. Okay, it's where the, the off diagonals are all the same value. And in fact, because of the symmetry of the covariance, basically the gamma of one is equal to gamma of minus one. Gamma of minus two is equal to gamma of plus two. Because of the covariance stationarity, it's actually also symmetric. So, so these equations allow us to solve for the fees so long as we have estimates of these covariances. So if we have a system of estimates, uh, we can plug these in and attempt to solve this. Um, if they're consistent estimates of the covariances, then there will be a solution. And then the zeroth equation, which was not part of this series of equations, if you go back and look at the zeroth equation, that allows you to get an estimate for the sigma squared. 
So, so th these Yule Walker equations are the way uh, in which uh, many ARMA models are specified in different uh, statistics packages, and uh, the uh, um, in terms of you know what principles are being applied. Well, if if we're using unbiased estimates of these parameters, then this is applying what's called the method of moments principle for statistical estimation. And with complicated models, where sometimes the likelihood functions are very hard to estimate or specify and compute, um, and then to do optimization over those is even harder, um, it, it can turn out that there are relationships between the moments of the random variables, which are functions of the unknown parameters. And you can solve for <coughs> basically the sample moments equaling the theoretical moments, and you apply the method of moments uh, estimation method. Econometrics is uh, you know, rich with many uh, applications of that principle. Uh, okay, the next section goes through the uh, moving average model. Um, let me. Uh, highlight this. Okay, so with an order Q moving average, we basically have a polynomial in the lag operator L, which is operated upon the eta t's. And if you write out the expectations of xt, you get mu. The variance of xt is just gamma naught is sigma squared times 1 plus the squares of the uh, coefficients in the polynomial. And so this feature, or this property here is due to the fact that we have uncorrelated innovations in the uh, eta t's. The eta t's are white noise. So the only thing that comes through in the square of xt and the expectation of that is the squared powers of the uh, eta's, which have coefficients given by the theta i squared. So these properties are you know, left, I'll leave you just to, to verify, very straightforward. Uh, but let's now turn to, in the final minutes of the lecture today, to accommodating non-stationary behavior in time series. Um, the uh, original approaches with time series was to focus on estimation methodologies for covariant stationary process. So if a series is not covariant stationary, then we would want to do some uh, transformation of the data of the series into uh, a stationary, uh, so, so that the, result, the resulting process is stationary. And uh, with the differencing operators, delta, um, Box and Jenkins advocated removing non-stationary trending behavior, which is exhibited often in economic time series, by using a first difference, maybe a second difference, or a kth order difference. So um, the, uh, uh, these operators you know, are defined in this way. Um, basically, with the kth order operator uh, having this expression here, this is sort of the binomial expansion of uh, you know, a kth power, which um, can be useful. Um, anyway, it comes up all the time in probability theory. Uh, and if, if a process has a linear time trend, then delta xt is going to have no time trend at all. Because if you, you're basically taking out that linear component by taking successive differences. Sometimes if you have a real series and you look at the difference, it appears non station you look at first differences, that can still have, not appear to be growing over time, and in which case sometimes the second difference uh, will result in a process with no trend. So these are uh, sort of convenient tricks, techniques to, to render the series stationary. And um, let's see, there's sort of examples here of linear trend reversion models which are rendered uh, covari uh, covariant stationary under first differencing. So if you, okay, in this case, this is an example where you have a deterministic time trend, but then you have reversion to the time trend over time. So we basically have 
a to t, the error about the deterministic trend is a first order autoregressive process. And the moments here can be derived this way. Um, leave that as an exercise. Um, one can also consider uh, the pure integrated process and talk about uh, stochastic trends. And uh, basically, random walk processes are, are often referred to in econ econometrics as stochastic trends. And you may want to try and eliminate those from, from uh, remove those from the data or accommodate them. And so, uh, but the stochastic trend process is uh, basically given by the first difference xt is just equal to uh, a to t. And so we have essentially this random walk from a given starting point. And it's easy to verify that if you knew the zeroth point, then the variance of the tth time point would be t sigma squared, because we're summing t independent innovations. And the covariance of, uh, between uh, t and lag t minus j is simply t minus j sigma squared. And the correlation between those has this form. What you can see is that this definitely depends on time, so it's not a stationary process. Um, so uh, this first differencing um, results in stationarity, and the undifferenced process has, has those features. The uh, okay final. Uh, let's see where we are. Okay, final topic for today um, is just how you incorporate. Uh, non-stationary process into armor processes. Well, um, if you take first differences or second differences and the resulting process is covariant stationary, then uh, we can just incorporate that differencing into the model specification itself and define ARIMA models, autoregressive integrated moving average processes. And so to specify these models, we need to determine the order of the differencing required to move trends, deterministic or stochastic, and then estimating the unknown parameters, and then applying model selection criteria. So let me go very quickly through this and um, come back to it at the beginning of the next time. But in specifying the parameters of these models, we can apply maximum likelihood, again, if we assume normality of these innovations a to t. And we can express the ARMA model in state space form, which results in a form for the likelihood function, which we'll see in a few lectures ahead. Um, but then we can apply uh, limited information maximum likely, where we just condition on the first few observations of the data and maximize the likelihood. or not condition on the first few observations, but also use their information as well and look at their uh, density functions, incorporating those into the likelihood relative to the stationary distribution for their values. And then the issue becomes, how do we choose amongst different models? Now, you know, last time we talked about linear regression models, how you'd specify a given model. Here we're talking about autoregressive moving average I mean, integrated moving average processes, and how do we specify those? Well, with the method of um, maximum likelihood, there are procedures which, uh, there, there are measures of um, how effectively a, a, a fitted model is given by an information criterion um, that you would want to minimize for a given fitted model. So we can consider different sets of models, different numbers of explanatory variables, different orders of uh, autoregressive parameters, moving average parameters, and compute, say, the Akik information criterion or the Bayes information criterion or the Hannon Quinn criterion as different ways of judging how good different models are. And let me just finish today by 
pointing out that what these information criteria are is basically a function of the log likelihood function, which is something we're trying to maximize with maximum likelihood estimates. And then adding some penalty for how many parameters we're estimating. And so what I'd like you to think about for next time is, you know, what kind of a penalty is appropriate for adding an extra parameter? Like, what evidence is required to incorporate extra parameters, extra variables in the model? You know, would it be t-statistics that, that exceed some threshold or some other criterion? Turns out that these are all related to those issues, and uh, it's very interesting how, how those play out. And um, I'll say uh, that if, for those of you who have actually seen these before, uh, the Bayes information criterion corresponds to an assumption that there is some finite number of variables in the model, and you know what those are. The Hannon Quinn criterion says maybe there's an infinite number of variables in the model. But um, you want to uh, be able to identify those. And so um, anyway, it's, it's a very challenging problem with model selection. And these criteria can be used to specify those. So we'll go through that next time.